All right, so I'm back here at my uh, welding, my handy welding bench here. Um, no sense in making things more difficult or more time consuming than necessary. Um, I've seen people build jigs that are more elaborate and more intricate than the components they're fabricating, which is great if you're making, you know, hundreds of something or, or you know, or dozens of something and you want absolute 100% accuracy. Where I'm just trying to duplicate lengths from, from center to center and the angle in this tubing. Um, keep it, uh, rule is kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, <laughs> Uh, all I did is I took some uh, rod and welded it to this piece of square tubing here. Once I sit, put it through the centers of my pin or my uh, bolt holes in the bushings. And what I did is I just kind of took the center of all that slop and centered it up and welded on this tube side. Then I and then I know that both of these joints are parallel. Even though this tube has a, a 10 degree bend in, I think that's what it was. Yeah, that tube's gonna have a 10 degree bend in it. It's one and three quarter DOM. It's gonna have a 10 degree bend in it for, to allow for the tire clearance to come in. These two bushings are perfectly in alignment. So that means this end and this end, the surf, they're gonna be parallel. So that's another reason why I kind of just mock it up on a makeshift jig like this. Then what I do is I'll just go ahead and slide, slide that off, roll that like so. This bushing, I just kind of half set that, it's not pressed in tight, it's just in there enough to, um, get, some, get, to get a measurement. Then I'll set that on there like so. This other end is going to go with the Johnny joint. And what I did is I kind of centered it to where with the jam nut. I've got a little bit of leeway either way. I'm going to be I'm going to be pretty close to spot on because I'm going to use these measurements and it'll go right back in. My alignment was right on, so I'm going to be pretty close. So what I'm going to do is I want to have a little bit of an adjustment either way. So I'm going to set the threads to the end of that. So with the jam nut, and that'll give me oh half to three quarters of an inch adjustment either direction. So that's how I'm setting that up. So I slide that down on there. Now I know from this bushing to there I need a piece 28 inches long. This is going to be a little longer because I have two weld on bushings. This is going to be a threaded one. So this tube is actually about 30 and a half to the point where it welds to each of those bushings. This one I need to make a piece 28 inches and the center of that band needs to be about 14 and a half inches from the axle end is where I'll put it in the bender and bend that 10 degree. Then I'll set it in here and tack it and then finish weld it. On the end of the tube, this has this, this uh, threaded bung here has a chamfer, so I'm gonna do the same thing on the tube. I'm gonna put a chamfer so that it's the two chamfers sitting like this and then I'll weld the inside with that, uh, weld the inside. Sometimes I've actually even gone and drilled holes in the tubing and Rosette welded it, but on something like this, that's gonna be that weld around that perimeter is gonna be plenty strong. This end over here, I'm gonna fish mouth to fit this two and three quarter. Probably just do that freehand, and then it will be welded around full circumference. And then that that one's done. So I'll need to make two of them with this. They're just gonna be mirrored for side to side. Then once I get that one done, then I'll do the same thing for the upper one. The upper one's gonna be a little shorter and a little bit smaller studs on it. And then I'll just go ahead and knock these off the die grinder and reuse those for the rear when I do the rear. So there again, keeping it simple, no sense in making it any more intricate or time consuming than necessary. It's just a simple jig and when I'm done, I'll knock the edges off, knock the little spot welds off, the tube will go stood back up in the corner and use it for something else. So I will go ahead and do that. And I'll come back when I've got the other piece bent and everything and ready to weld well, in. Well, I uh, kind of have an idea, had an idea here uh, when I was laying these out on my fixture over on the welding table. I started thinking, I already got the bend in these. Oops, I've already got the bend in these. All I had to do was cut it and weld the bung in, threaded bung in for the Johnny joint. So it was kind of almost senseless to waste the uh, one and three quarter DOM that I had. Uh, and ready for this project. So what I did is I just ended up cutting off all these components. Here's the um, the axle end. You can see how much play 
is in these bushings. And then I ended up cutting off, and you can see how much play is in, slop is in that one. So and then I ended up cutting off the others where the rod end needed to thread in. So this way I just saved myself uh, I don't know, a few feet of DOM tubing for another project. So uh, these already, like I said, these I know these already fit. I just got thinking about that going, why am I going to bend up new tube when I've already got the bends, everything, just lop off the one end, weld my... Uh, Sleeves that I machined on, and then on the other end, measure, measure it out, lop it off. I drilled uh, a couple of holes, 180 degrees apart, straight through, for rosette welds, or plug welds if you want to call them. And then the other ones I just took and burned them in good all the way around. So those two are done, lined up, lined up perfectly. You can see how perfectly symmetrical they are, even right down to the angle. I, and this is just off of my cheap little makeshift fixture that I did. Like I said, I was able to do all that with just a, a piece of square tubing and a couple of rods just to orientate the centers and that's it. So I'll keep those over there so I have my measurements. I should be able to put this back in based off of those two pins through the bushings and my alignment, everything, my caster, everything should be spot on. So all I have to do now is cut these ends off and I'm going to do the same thing on these. And I'm going to go do that now. And then the front's ready to paint and install. Well, as soon as I already had shavings on the mail from uh, drawing those for front links, I just decided rather than try to do this on freehand, I just chuck the, uh, this is the upper rear control arm, I decided to chuck it up here in the vise and use a shell or an end mill here to uh, come down in and cope it. So there's the uh, cope or fish mouth if you want to call it and boom nice tight fit on the end link so that was quick and simple and I'll go over and weld this on I'll knock the powder coating back and champ I'll probably put a chamfer around that for heat, uh, penetration and go ahead and weld this on all right got it fish mouthed and chamfered and basically that's the kind of fit you're after you can't even see daylight through that so I'll uh, clamp this down and tack it and weld it. So I've got the upper links in. They fell right into place. Um, just had to grab an axle, uh, tie strap and hook it on and pull the axle back about a quarter of an inch. But yeah, they dropped right in. Um, I noticed one thing when I was pulling this apart and I forgot about it till just now. But if on the, on the lower control arms where they mount to the f axle, you can see there's a square hole here and it's a little larger than the actual bolt. And then there's two raised pieces. What this is for is on the, uh, um, for the factory, they have a small eccentric there that will position that very so, very, ever so slightly. But you can tell there's, oh, there's 60 thousandths or so of slop in there. So I am going to, uh, it, once, once this is tightened down on that sleeve, it's doubtful that anything would move, but I just don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to machine a piece. I think, about, I think I've got some one and a half inch round stock. I think I'm going to machine a piece of one and a half inch round and machine it to the um, 14 millimeter, 550,000, 555,000, I think is what it is. And then I'll put it up on there and I'll just weld it like here and here on each side. Probably make them, I've got plenty of bolts, so I might make them, oh, uh, prob probably, hundred thousandths, hundred and fifty thousandths thick, something like that. Something that'll give it some support. And then just tack weld a couple places and then that bolt will sit dead solid in there and not move around. Just like it does at the, at the frame end. Oh, and I also painted the frame brackets while I was at it. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn a couple, uh, looks like I need four of them on the uh, lathe. I found a piece of one and a half. I think that's one and a half. Grab it off the shelf there. Yep, one and a half uh, round stock. So I'm going to check this up, drill a um, 14 millimeter hole in it. I think the closest I have is a 9 which is only going to be oh, about 7 thousandths over. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and check this up and I'll probably slice them off, slice them, dice them, oh, 100 thousandths, maybe, 100 and, maybe 125 millimeters, just an even eighth inch. So um, love this, uh, absolutely love this one and nine sixteenths bore lathe to be able to put a one and a half inch piece through that spindle on the lathe 
That is nice. I did not have that feature on my last lathe, so this is sweet. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and let's go ahead and set up speed here. So we got 400 steel divided by 1.5. So we're gonna turn about, oh, I'll go 300. Actually, that's what the machine is set up for already. So and I got my potentiometer so I can ramp up the RPM as I get closer to the center. this off so it's nice and I'm actually going to bump my travel on feed rates just a little bit. There we go. Face this off, I'll move the camera because I gotta come in and center drill and uh, drill the hole and the camera's in the way. So I'll go ahead and center drill it, drill it, and then I'll come back in those on the part them off. Alright, so I've got the cutting tool in here. Um, what uh, I like to do on these is just walk over the grinder and touch them up very slightly on this front edge. Uh, touch the bottom in and bring it up in so you got a nice crisp edge. And then also I actually turn them just a little bit so that the right side, the part you're parting off, is actually leading ever so slightly the other, the left side. And what that does is as you're feeding the work in, that one there will cut a clean edge on the part you've dropped off versus if you come straight in, you get those little tiny, thin, paper thin rings around your work sometimes it drops off. This kind of eliminates that. So I put a slight angle on that. So I'm going to touch that up one more time real quick. Okay. So now I'll come in and drop that on the tool holder. And um, some people will come in and touch off the face here and then move in to compensate for the thickness of the work. Um, I generally, I, I just find that I'll lay my, my, uh, Machine is square up there and just touch it till the light's gone. Zero out my test indicator and move it 125 thousandths. Lock it down. Turn my speed down a little bit here. And go ahead and start parting. Now this is a very stressful um, part of the machining process. So you want to make sure you have a rigid setup here. And uh, you see the chips are coming off in nice, nice formation there. Um, make sure your tool is sharp and make sure it's dead nuts perpendicular. If it's off at all, you're going to be feeding that tool in at an angle and it's going to be dragging on both sides. It's going to be making a groove wide, much wider than the um, parting tool itself and creating a lot more heat than necessary. You're already creating a lot of heat in this process. That's why you want to keep a lot of lubrication going but you don't need to be side loading the tool and, and, and chamfering, basically chamfering your work as you're feeding it in either. So watch your chips coming off your curls and feed accordingly. Uh, generally I have a uh, rod that I put in the drill chuck in the tail stock that reaches in and catches the parts so they don't drop into the chip tray. However, the camera right now is in the way of that, so what I'm going to do is just go ahead and let this piece just fall into the chip tray. It's no big deal. This is the only procedure I've done on this, so I know the machine was, was clean prior. So I will uh, just fish it out of the uh, chip tray as soon as it drops in. So you can still, still got nice curls coming off of there. It's feeding in nice and smooth. I don't feel any chattering. Uh, occasionally you can get where it'll catch and bind a little bit. Um, back out quick enough, you can save your part and actually save the finish too. Um, so you just want to watch those curls coming out of there. I'm building up a little bit in there, so I'm going to uh, back it out and get a little bit more loop down inside there. There we go. Clearing those other chips out of there helps because they're uh, 
creating drag and interfering with that cutting edge sometimes, so they won't let the chips spell out the groove. So, just about through, I think. Some of that oil that's working its way back towards the chuck. Hurt it back into position there. Boom, now do you see? That's a perfect example. By having that leading edge now, the part dropped into the chip tray. A little on the warm side, but let me uh, clean that off here real quick and you'll see. Okay, you can see how clean that edge is. No, no interference there. And we grab a bolt. And you see how nice that's nice and snug. So then this will go in on either side, and I'll just run a little stitch weld, probably three eighths half inch down either side, and hold that in there. So and you can, now what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll just, well actually I could probably just go ahead and finish feeding that in. Boom, knock that edge off, come back out. Now I can either move over 93 thousandths and then zero out my indicator and move another 125 or I can touch off and either way. So I'll go ahead and knock off the other, the remaining three and um, come back when we're welding them back onto the on the lower control arm mounts. Okay, there's all four spacers and 123 thousandths, 120 thousandths, 130, 124. So you can see how accurately you can get just by parting off. If, if this was more critical than that, um, I probably would have given myself a few thousands for a face cut, but on a spacer like this and just to clean up the slop in those bolt holes, there's no slop there now. This will go through there. And just to clean up the slop in those, that was worth the 10 minutes. It took to machine those and probably two or three minutes, probably five minutes to weld them on. And again, I'll put the bolt through with a nut on either side to tighten it in place and then just put a weld down either side. Um, that quick and simple, boom. And oh, oh, also, I did run a, just a hand chamfer to knock the little, to knock any little ridge off there. I just like to do that on all these. You don't want to put it in a, you know, put it in a drill press or a lathe and take too much chamfer off because as you take the chamfer off, you're moving, you're, you're moving that edge in. You're pretty much defeating the, your whole point here. What you're doing is, you, it's in essence, taking surface area away from supporting that bolt. So you've got 125 thousandths all the way around surface area holding that. If you put a chamfer and you go in each side, you might reduce that down to only 50 or 60 or 70 thousandths where it's supporting that bolt. So you don't want to really do a, run a chamfer on that like I would like on a, a big bracket or something for cosmetics and, and you know, just to make it look nice and take that edge away. You don't want to do it on something like this. Okay, I'll get the welder out and we'll uh, move it over there and weld these on. So you can see there, I just put a uh, bead top and bottom, probably, oh total, probably maybe halfway, ends up being about half the circumference of the, there we go, it's a probably a little better picture there. So, nice and solid, and I'll pull that out, put a little paint on it, and throw the lower control arms in. Well, I've got all, I showed these just in a previous clip there, these are all done, these are all wiped down, sanded. I opted to TIG weld these, uh, let's see if we can get a, just because of how close in proximity the fish mouth was to that uh, where the snap ring groove goes on one side and the, the, the uh, ow, uh, bland on the other side. So I opted to TIG weld those just so I wouldn't, uh, the, the MIG would probably eat away a little bit more at that. You, you could concentrate the heat down here on the tube, but where the tube is actually probably a little thinner, well it's probably about the same thickness as this, it, it'd, it'd be really hard to keep the MIG out of that snap ring groove. So the TIG's just a little easier to control. So you can see how I TIG welded those around there. These are all uh, sanded, wiped down with uh, pre-cleaner, 
and ready to paint. So I'm going to go ahead and paint them so I can get them installed in the morning. Um, you saw how much play that bolt that bolt had before I put these uh, outer well these outer spacers on, and then all of a sudden, and that was probably half the slop that the actual bushing had that I just removed from the BDS. So now you can see I can it swings, but there is absolutely no no um, radial movement in there. So turned out pretty good now. I'll put the other end up, the Johnny joint up end at the, at the frame end. But yeah, that was well worth taking the probably 20 minutes by the time I machined those spacers, dug the welder over here, knocked the paint off where those went, welded them on, and then touched up the paint. But that's 20 minutes well spent. Plus one thing, that's the thing I gotta worry about slopping around. Okay, I'll uh, get the fronts buttoned up and move on to the rear. So I've got the links, I've got the uppers here set. I had measured from center hole to center hole 22 and 3 quarters uh, before I started cutting and welding. So um, that's what I set them back to. And once I get the uh, upper control arm up under the Jeep and bolt it in and set down on the ground, then I'll go ahead and tighten these jam nuts up. For right now, I just left them loose. So they're, they're easier to tighten on the vehicle. I've got the bushings pressed. I've got the Clevite bushings pressed in with the sleeves I machined. Beautiful fit, pressed right in. And I'm just threading in the Johnny joint at the other end. And again, I'm gonna leave this just slightly. I'm kinda got an idea of where I need to be. I'll go set this over there in the fixture in a moment and uh, get it set to the right length from the original one. So um, I uh, like to take some anti-seas and smear it deep down into the threads. Plus, go ahead and hit the threads on the joint itself. Um, generally, you can coat the first couple, and uh, as it threads in, it will uh, smear it up through the threads. But I don't like to put big gobs on. I like to actually brush it deep down into the threads, and then wipe kind of the, just wipe wipe the excess off. And even at that, um, I end up getting a little ring. As you're threading the joint in, you'll get a little ring that'll kind of, uh, or bolt or anything for that matter, you'll get a little ring of the anti-seize that pushes up, and then right before it actually makes contact with whatever uh, weldment you're screwing into, or in this case, the bung, I'll take a rag and wipe that around, just so it doesn't ooze that anti-seize all over. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just being a little more anal than you need to be, but uh, I don't know, I guess, uh, I guess that's what uh, separates the men from the boys, right? Um, another comment is I've heard, uh, especially on some of the, or excuse me, read on some of the forums that people are saying to leave the joint in the bung when you weld it in. Otherwise, it'll distort and you won't be able to get, uh, get the joint in afterwards. I disagree with that. I don't ever, ever leave the joint in. Um, when I weld it, I will set it up in the fixture as you, as you saw in some of the other pictures over the, or the video over there. And then I'll take and put a couple of tacks, three or four tacks around it. <coughs> Excuse me. Thread the joint out, get the joint right out of the way. The joint's going to distort a little bit no matter what. It's all about heat control. So if you just sit there and you burn that all the way around, one fail swoop, you run a pretty good risk of um, distorting that. What I'll usually do is run it in thirds or halves. And this, these two examples, uh, these two controls, I was actually able to do it in halves. I kind of started off, kind of off with the gun to where it was a bit of a stretch. And then I come around and ended down on, on a down slope over here. Then I, and I kind of went to the other one and come around to the same thing and bounced back and forth. And as you can see, um, I'm having no problems threading that joint in. I've done hundreds of joints over the years from big ones like this to uh, small uh, 3 8 5 16 on some of our drag quads that we was building. We was using the, was machining little bungs, uh, 5 16 thread, and most of those I was just cutting with a tap. I'd machine the outside, cut the threads of the tap, take the tubing, slide it in there, and those were all TIG welded, of course, where I, I MIG welded these. And I could have TIG welded these, um, but to be honest with you, 
once they're painted and, and, and up under the Jeep, I don't know, you'll see the difference. And I've got a really nice, pretty MIG weld on each end of there. I did TIG weld, as you saw, the uh, smaller ends, the upper ends, just because of how close in proximity I got to the, um, the snap ring groove and the uh, ring light, uh, the, the back land. So I wanted to be able to control the heat a little better. But if you sit there and look now with everything painted, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. So I could have TIG welded them. MIG was just a little faster. I also plug welded and then just took kind of lightly with a roll lock disc. I think I used like a 50 or an 80 grit roll lock disc and just knocked that off so you can't tell there's a rosette weld there. Um, and obviously they were gray before. Uh, powder coating on these was less than uh, I've seen. I breathed over them with some 220 on a DA and boom, it came, I mean, it came right off. There wasn't very much powder coating on there. So um, anyway, uh, don't, don't be scared of welding these joints in. Just think methodically through it and put some heat in it and then get away from it for a second, put some heat in it. Um, I was talking to a, a coworker the other day. It says he had to go buy a $160 tap left and right hands because when he was doing his he welded them in and the joints wouldn't fit and he had to um, run taps through it that just seems like an added expense that you don't need you buy a you know a thir 12 13 dollar thread in bung and a 50 60 dollar joint that's the whole point is otherwise why not just get tubing and thread it if you're if you gotta go get a tap buy a tap and everything afterwards hell he, he paid as much for that tap as he did for probably three joints so just just Take your time, think things through, and you won't have any problems uh, with distortion on that. Like I said, these are these are threading in very very easily, and I put a lot. I mean, I put a lot of heat on there. I had this, I had it turned up, wire speed and everything. I mean, I wasn't like 20 volts. I think I was around 17 volts and 260, 250, 250 inches per minute, something like that. And I got a nice uh, flow. The toes wet in nice. A good fusion to this bung as well as the tubing and you, I mean you don't need more than that I mean it's it can only you, your the tube the tube will probably give away before that weld joint does so um, anyway just no sense in in overthinking that and, and spending more money buying taps but I, I highly advise against leaving the joint in if you're if you're putting that much heat in where it's going to dis, dis, uh, distort Without the joint in there, trust me, it's going to distort with the joint in there, and you may have locked a $50, $60 joint into a bung that now, you, now you, can't, you can't adjust, you can't get out. So um, I, I never weld with the uh, um, joint in, in the bung at all. So anyway, these are all pretty much done. I'm going to go over to my fixture now and set the length on these two lowers and put the front axle back in, in place. All right, rear suspension out. Link's gone. Uh, well, they're over here on the bench. So here's the lower. This one actually isn't in too bad a shape. This one's flopping around pretty good. I've got a good, look at that play. There's a good eighth, eighth of an inch in there. Um, let's see, over here. That one's sixteenth or so. And this one's not too bad. So the lower links on the rear, even the one, even down here on this on this end, there's a little bit of play in there. I replaced all these at the same time I did the front, so these have only got about twenty-two thousand driving, probably three maybe towing. So probably twenty-five thousand or so is all on these, on the uh, inserts, the poly inserts on these, and the bushings down at this end, which. To me is unacceptable. That's just that there's that's you should get more miles than that out of these. So that's hence why I'm going back to the the OEM style of cleavite bushings. So okay, we'll get these ones cleaned up, cut apart and welded. And this one's actually the one that I had um, one of my build threads I showed where I actually this in here this blew the snap ring out on one of our trips, and I stuffed it back in there. Found a guy with a MIG welder and or uh, excuse me, a TIG welder, and put a couple stitch welds around the snap ring to hold it in there. And when I got back, I machined a new end for this, because BDS wanted to sell me a whole new link. So I just machined a new end and welded it on. So now I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to weld another end on there here with go to the Johnny joint. And then on that end will be the, the uh, cleavite. So no more poly bushings. 
uh, see we'll see down the road how much better the ride is. I know my son's when we did his he uh, picked up a little less road vibration through it and I know that's one of the uh, the big um, selling points of the rubber versus the poly. I know when I had my old Suburban I had a big block in it and I put all poly motor mounts uh, suspension mounts in the in the leaf springs. I went with all uh, I think it was poly performance I used on them and I could pick up a lot of vibrations from the uh, not only the engine and everything but road vibrations so we're gonna go back to the rubber okay I'll start cutting these apart alright the, if you remember the front lowers the uh, end links <clears throat> were pretty much parallel with each other they just had a, a 10 degree angle to clear for the tire when the tire turned at full lock. The rears are not that way. The rear comes off the rear axle and then kicks out to the frame to allow for that tire clearance. So when the axle is going up full stuff and then drooping, so I had to get a little bit more elaborate on my jig. So I used the same pin on this end, but on this end I had to come up because this angle comes out and up. It doesn't return and end up being parallel. So these links are at different angles. So this way, that one goes on there, that one goes on there, goes all the way down. This is parallel, and that's parallel. So now, as long as I make the other length that same exact length, where, like I say, it is adjustable in this end, but I'll set it to this. So when I put it in, my pinion angle and everything is dead on, because I didn't have any vibrations. I had, I had tweaked it when I first set the, the suspension up to get my uh, pinion angle on the, on the differential to match uh, offset the one coming out of the transfer case. So I don't want to have to go through all that again. So it's just easier to throw a little simple jig together like this. And like I said in the, in the other section, you don't have to get elaborate. You can see this is basically just some little pieces of scrap metal welded together. And to be honest with you, I'll knock these tacks off after and throw these back in my metal bin and use them down there. I'll probably. Like this in here, I might cut it off here and cut it off over here. But other than that, that's still usable steel after. So I'll set that aside and start uh, cutting the links to put the cleavite on this end, Johnny joint on this end, just like I did the lowers on the front. Well, this is the last link here, so I thought I'd try to do a close up of the weld. Just got to do the. Uh, adjustable in now and this one's pretty much done well we've got all the rear links done and hanging here painting painted so tomorrow I should be able to install those and while I was at it I went ahead and scuffed my frame down wiped the frame down scuffed it down and went ahead and blacked it all out the fresh coat of gloss black paint. He's the Eastwood epoxy paint. Uh, seems to work pretty good. He's, holds up holds up real well. So there's around this side. Under the frame there. And there we go. So next step, uh, I'll come out probably tomorrow, and it's been a long day so far today, but I got all the suspension cut and welded and painted. So tomorrow I will come out, install the rear, and probably be able to set her back down on the ground. Okay, I'll, I'll be back when I uh, got it all done and sitting on the, sitting all, the wheel, all the tires and wheels. Front installed, bolted down. Um, you want to make sure that on the Johnny joints where the center spherical end can pivot in that bushing, no big deal. You can tighten them down. But on these uh, Clevite style, you want to keep the bolt loose. You don't want it with the suspension sagging. You don't want to tighten those up because then when you put weight down on it, you're going to preload that bushing, that rubber encapsulated bushing in there. So you want to set it down to ride height before you tighten that. Same thing for the upper one up here. You want to set it down, get the weight on the tires and wheels, and get it set at ride height before you tighten these uh, 
Cleavite style bushings, otherwise you're just going to take that bushing out uh, sooner than you need to. What you want to do is you want to get it centered in there, tighten it down, and then either flex either way, you're pulling the bush, you're turning that bush in the same direction either way. If you tighten it up sitting here and all of a sudden you set it down and it preloads that, you're already preloaded sitting at right height. Now when you compress it, it goes up, it's even twisting more and you can split those bushings out. So make sure you do not tighten those until it's sitting down at right height. I usually sit it down and then I bounce on it a few times and get it settled in good and then crawl under and retighten them and, and or, uh, tighten the, the bolts down. So you can see, there's my Johnny joint. I put the grease zerk up because with the suspensions dangling like this, you can get a grease gun on it. Um, this one here, obviously, I pointed down because it doesn't, you know, it, it, I'm not going to get a rock up into there. But over here, I, if, if, if I turn that joint 180 degrees, the joint, the, uh, the grease zerk could have been fitting, sitting right here, right exposed to a, a rock or something. So I put it up and uh, just for protection. Well, it's Sunday morning and uh, just come out and put the uh, rear together. So I'll do a quick walk around. There's the, the front. Uh, I also blacked the frame out last night. And here is the here are the rear links. Upper and lower links all installed. Uh, grease circs again pointing up there and down there. Oop, need to wipe a little bit of grease off, have a little more of these out. And uh, I think I'm going to uh, drop my skid underneath here and uh, grease my U-joints real quick, my drive shaft and my double carbon joint and then set her back down on the ground, put the tires and wheels on. And I'll uh, show some pictures of that once I get her sitting down and see, you should be able to see the front half of the links because before you could always see them when they were silver. So I'll uh, tie in with the body pretty good. Finished, just got back from road test. Took it for a spin and it feels like a completely different Jeep at stop signs. You uh, hit the brakes and it actually, you don't feel any movement underneath between the axles and the frame. So here's, let me just kind of shoot down. And that's it. New links for the Wrangler Rubicon. Ready for the trails this weekend. All right. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for watching. If you have any comments, please feel free to post them in the comment section. Thanks.